Hello and good evening, everyone. Welcome to our session. Tonight we have lessons from planning, uh, from the planning process for growing from the root, Philadelphia's urban agriculture plan. And we're very excited to have Dr. Ashley Gripper with us this evening. So as always, a big thank you to our supporters and funders, especially the Center for the Education of Women, the Residential College, um, Dr. Kyle White, Latin American and Caribbean Studies, the School of Public Health, the School for Environment and Sustainability, and the Department of American Culture. Uh, food literacy uh, is led by a dynamic team. We have our co-leaders, Shakira Tyler, uh, me, Jessica Kenyatta Walker, uh, Lily Fink Shapiro, and we, of course, are supported by our um, larger team, including Megan Gross, Nayaxi Hernandez, Kimmy Vandewedge, and Chris Taylor. As a reminder, food literacy is free and open to the public. We just urge you to, again, keep registering with your email from UMICH if you're a student. And if you're a community attendee, um, a heads up that there are optional readings available on the FSSI website. Um, that's the um, Sustainable Food Systems Initiative website. Um, as you're listening, feel free to tweet at us uh, at SFSI underscore UM, hashtag food literacy for all. Uh, remember that our poll questions, getting two out of the three, uh, counts towards your attendance and participation if you're a student, and that all sessions are recorded and available on the FSSI website, usually by Wednesday or Thursday. Um, and closed captioning is also available. Please uh, use the Q&A box throughout our session if anything uh, comes up that you'd like our guests to address. Um, and that is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, a reminder that there is no class next week for our UM winter uh, slash spring break. Um, we will resume on March 7th. And a few important assignment reminders. Your harmonized preparation for this week is actually sharing content. So just be aware that we're not asking you to post kind of a one to three sentence reflection this week, but instead looking for content related to definitions of food apartheid and doing one reaction um, to your classmate. Um, a number of the re reminder that your second uh, team project is due March 17th, so be sure to get with your teams and begin planning for what you want to accomplish after spring break or during it, um, and that we strongly encourage you to um, do a assignment format that you didn't do previously. It's not certainly required, but we encourage it. Um, and another reminder that our first in-person session is happening March 14th. We'll be meeting in the Dana building in room 1040. Great, thanks, Jessica. I have a few more course announcements. So next week, or sorry, not next week, in two weeks, March 7th, join us. Um, Aliyah Frazier will be here and she will be presenting about food sovereignty and chocolate. And that's gonna be a virtual class. And then the week after that, March 14th, that's gonna be the in-person one, Fast Food for Thought. This is the ninth annual, which is just remarkable um, that we've had this many years of Fast Food for Thought. It's a really fun, high energy, fast paced event. I have a little bit of a speaker preview. So some of the, um, we're gonna hear from Joseph Stanhope Ciodella about deep roots, potatoes and the history of growing food in Detroit. Jennifer Blesch, a CS faculty member, is going to talk about rethinking soil carbon sequestration in agriculture. Of course, you all know Shakira Tyler. She's going to talk about the story of the Detroit Black Farmer Land Fund. John Vandermeer, he's in ecology and evolutionary biology. His talk is going to be about coffee, capitalism, colonialism, and Coca-Cola. And Andy Jones, he's from the School of Public Health. He's a nutritional scientist. He's going to talk about nudging Michigan diners towards lower carbon food choices. These are all going to be five minute talks. This is just a preview. The full list is coming soon on our website. You're welcome to check it out. Maybe someone can drop a link in the chat. Um, I see someone's asking, will this be recorded? Yes, it'll all be recorded. And you can find all the videos from prior years as well on our website near the Food Literacy for All videos. So, and oh, and we're starting out with, you know, a West African group drumming and dance performance. And there's going to be a delicious reception 
at the end. So there's so many reasons to come. Looking forward to see you then. Community members are also invited. Um, this is brand new. I'm really excited to announce this. We have funding for a summer internship fellowship. This is the first time we've been able to offer this. Um, if someone's able to drop a link in the chat with more information, that would be great. This funding opportunity is for food systems internships open to current master's students. It could be in any program across the university. The applications just opened yesterday and um, it's, it's, it's very exciting. So if this might be you, it's time to apply for it. So check it out. Also, this is our maybe seventh year or something like that with the urban agriculture, offering the urban agriculture internship. I've announced this before, so this will be our last week um, announcing it. But we, we did have an info session last week, but the applications are still open. So we'll drop a link in the chat to learn more about that with our partners in Detroit and Ypsilanti and the U of M campus farm. All right, and with that, I'm going to pass the virtual mic to Shakira to introduce our guest speaker. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Lily. Peace, everyone. Glad you can make it to join, uh, to listen to Dr. Grip um, share their stories about all the dope work they're doing um, in Philly around the urban agriculture plan. So I have the wonderful task of introducing uh, my dear soil sister. Uh, Ash has a PhD from Harvard um, in population health sciences, concentration, environmental epi epidemiology from the School of Public Health at Harvard. She also has a master's in public health from Columbia University and a bachelor's in sociology from Arcadia University. Uh, she's currently an assistant professor in the Department of Community Health and Prevention and an, and an affiliate of the Ubuntu Center on Racism, Global Movements and Population Health Equity. And she has a secondary appointment in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health. And overall, uh, Ashley's work had, resides at the intersections of activism, grassroots organizing, food justice, food sovereignty, with an unapologetic, explicit focus on Black people's connections um, to the natural environment, to Mother Earth, and the reclamation of land-based living and organ organizing practices. Um, she's also a community entrepreneur, a community organizer. She founded Land Based Johns in Philly, which is an up-and-coming uh, organization that I love to be a part of. Um, and stand in solidarity with from a distance. Um, and overall, her scholarship uniquely marries anti-racist social justice initiatives by taking a somewhat uncommon approach to community-engaged research. And just let me say that Ashley is one of the most beautiful human beings I've ever encountered <laughs> in this movement. And I'm so blessed to be in community with her. And I'm excited for her to share her work um, around what it really means to build the world that we need around uh, abolition, decolonization, food justice, food sovereignty, environmental justice, all the things that are intersectional and important for a new world to, to be. And I'm gonna pass it to Ashley. Thank you, my dear sister. Oh, you! I didn't plan to start today with tears, but um, that, was, that was heartfelt and I really appreciate you and I appreciate the invitation to be here tonight. Um, I'm going to share my screen, and I would love it, Shakira, if you could give me a thumbs up if you can see it, because um, you're the only one whose camera is on right now. Can you see my slide? Awesome. Awesome. So good evening, everyone. It is really a pleasure to spend some time with you all tonight. Um, so much love and gratitude to my dear Shakira and also the whole for Literacy for All team. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here. This talk tonight is mostly about some of the personal lessons that I've learned from the planning process of growing from the root, which is Philadelphia's first urban agriculture plan. Again, my name is Ashley Gripper, and I was born and raised in Philly. And I am currently at the Ubuntu Center on Racism, Global Movements, and Population Health Equity. Um, I want to uh, 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 highlight the Ubuntu Center because it's a center that I, I think is unlike any centers I've seen across the country. Um, the Ubuntu Center was really born from a student 
pushing for a center that was dedicated to anti-racism, but not just dedicated to anti-racism. Racism. They wanted a center that um, actually lived out the values that they preach. So the Ubuntu Center um, has been a beautiful place for me to land after my doctoral work because uh, the whole goal is to marry our scholarship, our academic work with um, activism in support of activism, in support of global movements, and specifically movements um, led by Black people across the world. Um, so I consider myself to be a grower, an educator, an organizer, and an epidemiologist. And um, like my dear sister said, my work meets at the intersections of activism, organizing, community building, and environmental health. So during our time together tonight, I'll start with a brief background on Black agriculture in the Southern United States. And that'll lead us into the practice of agriculture in Philadelphia and other cities. And then I'll share a little bit of background on the urban agriculture plan process um, before I dive into the historic timeline of land-based oppression um, in Philadelphia. And that timeline was a big part of, um, the, it is a big part of the urban agriculture plan. Um, so I won't cover, you know, the plan or the timeline in, in deep depth because it's a lot. It was a 190 page document, um, but the draft plan is available. So y'all are welcome to review the full plan on your own time. I'll share the link at the end of the presentation. And then after all of this, uh, we'll have some time for questions. And I really would like this discussion to be interactive. Um, I know this is webinar format. So, you know, as, as questions come up, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and then I'll try to get to them uh, at the end. So like I said, I wanna start by taking us through a really very brief historic review of some of the racism that black farmers have experienced in this country. And this is to help us understand some of the agriculture context that's happening in Philly today. I first realized my passion for food justice at the Black Farmers Conference in 2013. And in that year, Dr. Monica White was the keynote speaker. And she talked about Black farming cooperatives in the South and how they connect to Black folks growing in cities today. So Black farmers across the South, uh, people like Ms. Fannie Lou Hamer pictured here, created farming cooperatives largely in response to the anti-Black government and society. They created these cooperatives in response to supermarkets not serving Black customers, in response to white people terrorizing Black folks when they tried to register to vote. And what these cooperatives um, were was a means of providing economic autonomy, political education, collective agency, and community to Black people across the South. At the height of Black farming in the US in 1920, there were upwards of 1 million Black farmers and even more when you include sharecroppers. And they made up 14% of the farming population and owned over 16 million acres of land. But over the decades, documented USDA discriminatory policies and procedures, white terrorism and Jim Crow forced many Black people to leave their land and communities in the South and move to places like Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Detroit. So much so that from 1910 to 1997, Black farmers experienced between 80 and 90% theft of their land. Whites experienced only about 2% land loss. And from 1920 to 1997, the number of Black farmers declined by about 95%. So we haven't covered this yet, so don't feel bad if you don't know the answer. Um, but our first multiple choice question is in 2017, how many black farmers do the USDA have on record? I realized I forgot to read the answer choices. A, 375,000, B, 150,000, C, 45,000, or D, 10,000. Sorry, y'all. Okay, so about 6% of people said uh, 375,000, 31, 150, uh, 45% said 45,000, that's interesting, um, and 18% said 10,000. So the majority of y'all are correct. In 2017, 
uh, the USDA had 45,000 Black farmers on record. Um, and these uh, Black farmers made up at the, in 2017 only about 1% of the farming population. And to give some context, today about 95% of US farm owners are white. And they owned over three, they owned about 3 million acres of land compared to the 16 million acres they owned in 1920. So how did this happen? Well, first it happened through the documented USDA discriminatory practices that I mentioned earlier. It happened through loan and crop insurance denials. Um, it happened through blatant prejudice, like forcing black farmers off their land. And the great migration also contributed, which is often attributed solely to industrialization. But the reality is black people were being terrorized across the South. The other thing that's contributed to black land theft and land loss is air property, which makes black land more vulnerable to predatory practices by real estate companies and developers. Simply put, it happened because of racism, racist institutions, racist policies, and racist people. And as Black people migrated north because of Jim Crow, because of terrorism and land theft in the South, we brought our heritage of growing food and stewarding land with us. Philadelphia actually has a long history of urban growing. Vacant lot in the city was first recorded in 1897 and continued during and after World War II in the form of Victory Gardens. The city once had offered infrastructure for its people who wanted to practice self-reliance and grow their own foods on land that had been abandoned. But between the 1950s and 1990s, several things happened in Philly. There were waves of migration to Philadelphia by Black people from the South and Puerto Rican and Southeast Asian immigrants. And at the same time, white home and landowners fled the city and moved to the suburban areas. So this sharp decrease in population and the loss of industry left thousands of vacant lots and abandoned homes in the city. Philly at the same time was also experiencing another more permanent wave of urban growing. So while drug epidemics devastated our neighborhoods, many Black and immigrant communities reclaimed abandoned lots and spaces to grow food for themselves and their neighbors. In the 90s, the city started to decrease its infrastructural support for community-led agriculture, even though Philly still had 31,000 vacant lots and 26,000 abandoned homes on record. Regardless of the city's support, Black and immigrant communities in Philly continued and continue to reclaim lots and return to their agricultural roots, practices, and foods. Today, Philly has over 418 community food growing spaces. So now for our second question, you know, I just said that um, there were 31,000 vacant lots um, in the 90s or the 2000s, I don't remember when that was. How many vacant lots do you think Philly currently has? A, 10,000, B, 31,000, C, 40,000, or D, 60,000? Mm, okay, so uh, about 23% of y'all said 10,000, 27% said 31,000, 33% said 40,000 and 17% said 60,000. So these numbers are a little bit closer together, um, but the majority of y'all are right again. Um, it is C, 40,000. Um, Philadelphia currently has 40,000 vacant lots um, recorded, and I'm sure there's more. Uh, every day when I drive around, I see a, you know, I'm on a block and I'm like, there's three lots on this block, four lots on this block. Um, and a lot of, you know, people are doing what they've always done and, and, and reclaiming those lots to grow food, to, to beautify their neighborhoods, to take care when the city chooses to neglect and extract from us. So across the United States, uh, many cities either have a strong mayor or a strong city council generally. You don't always see both in the city. So Philly is a city that has a really strong and powerful city council. City council members have a lot of control over land sales in their 
and that makes it hard for community members to contend with developers and wealthy business owners for land. City Council control over land and the development projects that happen in their districts is, called, is, is something called council manic prerogative. And I don't know if this is entirely unique to Philly, um, but I think it's unique to Philly. <laughs> So it's, a, it's really a challenge because it's something that we have to navigate against as we are trying to, you know, make sure that our gardens and our farms are secure uh, and not in, being threatened by development. At this rally pictured here, uh, people were protesting to save their farms and gardens from being sold and developed. And across Philadelphia, growers are organizing, strategizing, and advocating for rights to land for collective healing and self-determination. So there are several reasons why my scholarship, advocacy, and activism are all rooted in Philly's urban agriculture movement. Number one, Philly is my hometown. This is where I was born and raised, so I have a lot of deep connections, relationships, and extensive networks here. I care a lot about this city. Um, anybody that knows me knows that. Two, Philly has a lot of community gardens and farms for a city of this size. Now, not necessarily comparable to Detroit, um, but we do, you know, we are up there in terms of the number of um, growing spaces that we have. Three, um, segregation coupled with resource extraction have left a lot of vacant and abandoned land in poor Black and immigrant neighborhoods in Philly. And Philly growers have said time and time again that gardens are a solution to food apartheid. They're a solution to extraction and to the health inequities that our people face. Food apartheid is different from food deserts. So deserts are naturally occurring landscapes that can be rich with life and food. Food apartheid, on the other hand, highlights the structural factors and actors that have contributed to an intentionally inequitable food system for Black folks and other minoritized groups. We hope that our advocacy, our activism, and our academic work will have an impact in the city by showing some of the health and social benefits of agriculture. And since many of the gardens in Philly are on city-owned land, there's actually a strong potential pathway to land security. So these charts show that over 50% of gardens in Philly are located on land that is not secure. So this means that the people who steward the land and care for the gardens do not actually own the land. However, because, most, because almost three quarters of these gardens are on city owned land, there might be a path to preservation if city council and land holding agencies provide support. So I mentioned early that, earlier that we have council manic prerogative, which means that city council has a lot of control over what happens in their districts. They you know, theoretically could choose to be more supportive of urban agriculture, of urban growing, um, of land reclamation in their districts. However, um, there's a lot of development and gentrification happening in the city. And that is, you know, uh, directly at odds with some of our movement work. So given the land crisis in Philly, plus consistent advocacy um, from grassroots ag groups in Philly, the Parks and Rec Department released a request for proposals for teams to design the city's first urban agriculture plan in the summer of 2019. Together, Soil Generation, uh, which is a black and brown coalition of growers um, and Interface Studio, which is a planning studio, were chosen as the team that would design the city's first urban agriculture plan. The planning team was made up of four folks from Soil Generation. My comrades, Katrina Baxter, Soad Mana, Sonia Galibert, and myself, um, plus three folks from Interface Studio, Mindy, Chris, and Maria. And throughout this planning process, there were two to three other people who were involved in different capacities. And the goal of uh, the urban agriculture strategic plan is to support the preservation and expansion of urban agriculture in Philadelphia. It's rooted in principles of racial and economic justice, sustainability, culture, and history. And we hope that this plan will increase land security for growers across the city. 
This plan is one of the first times in Philadelphia history where a plan was developed collaboratively and collectively with the grassroots group. Ash Richards is the inaugural director of urban agriculture for Philadelphia, and they were intentional and adamant about the need for planning proposals to include an in-depth strategy for community engagement and deep partnership. So our engagement strategy included multiple levels and layers. We began the process with diving into research and case studies that other cities have done in terms of food and agriculture plans. And then we compiled, compiled our resources and analyzed the different wins, losses, and successes of those cities across the country. So lesson number one, in collaborative planning or any collaborative work really, I believe it's important to begin the relationship building and establishing a foundation of how we want to be to one another. So I think that that whole process should start with building relationships. That whole process should start with us talking about how we relate to each other, how we care for each other, how we show up for each other um, and you know, honor each other's lived experiences. Um, the reasons why I think that's le lesson number one will become clearer in a little bit. So throughout this process, we had three public meetings. We conducted a series of focus groups. We conducted city interviews, steering committee meetings, and meetings with the Food, Food Policy Advisory Council. We also met with the city project team quarterly to share updates. And feedback from all of these different meetings and all of this different engagement um, directly informed the recommendations and the narrative of the plan. So back in 2016, um, this is way before the plan uh, was conceptualized or the, the, the request for proposals was conceptualized. But back in 2016, city council held a hearing on urban agriculture, uh, one of the first of its kind. And it was at that meeting, at that hearing that a city council member said there was no such thing as an urban agriculture constituency. Um, and that's because you know most city council members were plugged into the um, urban growing community. So they couldn't understand how that could even be a thing um, that many people were into. This picture here is from the first public meeting for the Urban Ag Plan on December 2nd, 2019. We had over 300 people in attendance and it was one of the city's largest public meetings ever. And it was so well attended that folks were seated across the floor and in the hallways. Um, in the bottom right, in the purple, uh, is my dear sister comrade Katrina Baxter, who is um, one of the, the, the on the planning committee um, for the urban agriculture plan or the planning team. I mentioned that the first public meeting had over 300 people in attendance. Over the entire planning process, we engaged over 650 different residents and agriculture stakeholders. So we engaged people of all ages, including youth, teens, adults, and seniors. Um, we also connected with people of several different races, ethnic groups, and language backgrounds. And we engaged both growers and non-growers. The planning process, or this particular planning process, has been so successful at gathering input from residents and growers because of the relationships that we hold. Um, generally, planning teams who get contracts say that they'll engage a community to inform what recommendations go in the plan. And generally, those planning firms are also not embedded in the communities that they're planning for. So the traditional planning process replicates this model of outsiders with a set of technical skills getting to decide what's best for a community that they're not a part of. So in my opinion, this was one of the most intentional and impactful aspects of this plan. So which brings me to lesson number two. If you are a planner or pushing for a plan to be done for your neighborhood, advocate for a partnership where planners and community members or grassroots groups have equal decision-making power. Um, like I said, that's not really common in the planning process. That's not common in city projects, but I believe that made a world of difference in terms of like the, the amount of people we were able to engage, the amount of people who were excited and enthusiastic about this plan. And it also made the data more richer. It made uh, what 
what information we got, it, it was easier to get that information and it was um, uh, more comprehensive. So our second public meeting was originally set to happen right around the time COVID first started sweeping through the US. The pandemic and brewing unaddressed racial tension um, caused us to actually plan, uh, caused us to actually pause the whole planning process. So for the first eight months of the plan, the dynamics within the planning team um, were tense. And that's largely because of the ways our labor as soil generation was being devalued or going unseen. So from June, from about June 2020 to December 2020, Interface and Soil Generation took a pause and had facilitated conversations on how anti-Black racism was showing up in the ways that we work together. So this was one of the first useful reconciliation processes that I've ever been a part of. Uh, I would say probably the only useful reconciliation process that I've ever been a part of. And on the other side, or racial reconciliation process. Um, so on the other side, Interface was better able to recognize how they were weaponizing white women tears and valuing the technical skills over all the labor that soil generation was contributing. And at Soil Generation, we also had to go through the process of articulating the invisibilized labor of, of us processing the problematic team dynamics and also the invisibilized labor of the anti-racism and accessibility reviewing that we had been doing. Um, so initially when we started out this process, that wasn't part of our scope of work. That wasn't something we said like, oh, this is a part of the work because, you know, as growers, as Black folks, like that's what we naturally do. We're like checking the boxes. We're like, this is not okay. You can't say this. Like we need to change this. This is how we talk in our community. And that wasn't considered labor, you know? So we had to go through the work of like being able to articulate, hey, y'all, like this is stuff that we're doing that is not being valued. Um, the same way that these technical skills are being valued. So we resumed the planning process um, and our communication and transparency with each other, along with our care of each other improved significantly. We hosted the second public meeting virtually in May, 2021, and it was organized into different stations. Um, stations included resources for community gardens, it included animal keeping, um, educating the next generation of growers, um, and a bunch of other things. Uh, the stations are actually listed on this slide, station one through 10, um, and that's what our second public meeting, our virtual public meeting included. Our uh, second public meeting also included the historic timeline of land-based depression, and that was the second station. And everyone who participated um, in this virtual public meeting was encouraged to walk through or to, to, um, to go through the historic timeline and engage with it. Ooh, take a little water break. So history informs the state and the stories of urban agriculture in Philadelphia. We thought it was important to provide a historical overview as context. And this allowed us to ground the plan in past events, in policies, and in political movements. So the historic timeline offers relevant history as it related to, or as it relates to people, land, and the practices of growing food in the Philadelphia area. We outline four major um, methods or strategies that racialized land-based oppression happens, um, at least in our region. Number one, uh, first was the displacement of black people, of indigenous people and of people of color. And this refers to the removal of indigenous people from their ancestral homes. It refers to the removal, removal of people from their sanctuary communities through forced migration, colonization and gentrification. The next strategy is the commodification of land. So this refers to the ways capitalism results in the privatization and individual ownership of land. So land is seen as non-living, land is seen as not autonomous, land is seen as exploitable and a means for building private wealth. 
The third method of land-based oppression that we outline is exploitation and erasure. Black communities and other communities of color have experienced labor exploitation and cultural appropriation related to land and agricultural practices. And the last method of land-based oppression that we outline here is exclusionary institutions. So historically and presently, white institutions, both private and public, including universities, prioritize white communities and offer them resources and opportunities to compound their generational wealth and power. Together, these practices systematically exclude black communities. They systematically exclude indigenous communities as well as other communities of color. However, to not only focus on oppression and the harms that our communities have experienced, we also describe different occurrences of collective action and self-determination in the history of the Philadelphia area. So each historical occurrence is color-coded by method of land-based oppression or collective action. The timeline begins with the Lenny Lenape people, who are some of the original stewards of what we presently know as Philadelphia and its surrounding areas. We highlight some of the land-based and growing practices of the Lenape people in this timeline. The timeline continues with the arrival of European colonists, their land theft, and the devastation they caused the Lenape people. In 1684, Africans were brought to Philadelphia and sold into enslavement and by and for Quaker settlers. Now, this piece of history is in the Philadelphia context is often and usually glossed over so that Quakers are painted exclusively as passive and abolitionists. But history tells us that is not the full picture. When Africans were forced to the US, they also carried their food waste, seeds, and agricultural knowledge with them. So this timeline continues by documenting the expansion of agricultural horticulture and farmers markets in Philadelphia. Um, so I'm progressing through quite a bit um, there's a lot of detail in between that I encourage you all to um, look up on your own time. You know, the I'll provide the link at the end of this presentation, and then you can actually go to the, the timeline and, and read it, you know, more in depth than I'm able to cover today. So the timeline continues by documenting the expansion of agriculture. Oh, I said this horticulture and farmer market, farmers markets in Philadelphia. And we also highlight specific time, time points of the Great Migration when Black people from the South moved to the city. We highlight some of the city's earlier community gardens. We like the arrival of Puerto Rican and Southeast Asian immigrants, as well as the Black Panthers Nationwide Breakfast Program. And towards the end of the 20th century, there was a boom in urban projects in Philadelphia. And then in the last 20 years, we've seen the formation of several partnerships and collaborations between growers in Philadelphia. So there's still much divestment and extraction happening today. Um, and much of this is due to the rapid development, gentrification and expansion of universities in the city. And like I said, city council members are at best complicit and at worst directly contributing to gardens and farms being sold to developers. But still, our work is to resist their advances and preserve and care for our communities in any and all ways. First and foremost, um, we designed this plan for Philadelphia growers. So I'm now gonna talk a little bit about the, some of the, um, a little bit more of the process and who this plan is for and like who we had in mind. So over the years, it's been clear that the biggest barrier to growing food and expanding food and ag work in the city is land security, hands down. Philly is a city that's been rapidly gentrifying and developing for over the last uh, about 10, 15 years. So coming into this process, we knew one of our biggest goals and our biggest recommendations would be to get a complete moratorium on gardens going to sheriff's sale and being sold and developed. So in Philly, I don't know about Detroit or other cities that y'all are from, we have something called sheriff sale. And that's when tax delinquent land goes um, to sheriff sale and it's sold basically in an auction format. Anybody can bid in on it. Um, traditionally sheriff sale, you had to be in Philly to physically bid on the land. 
And um, in the last year or two, it transitioned uh, to virtual land sales. And we were, you know, protesting and advocating against that uh, because we already have a hard time competing with uh, the wealthy folks in the area and the developers in the area. So virtual virtual share of sale meant that we would now have to compete to get land and to save land and preserve land with folks across the world. Um, so like I said, one of our biggest goals was to get to get a complete moratorium on any gardens going to share sale and being sold and developed. There was also a strong constituency of animal tenders and keepers in Philly. So we heard repeatedly and very loudly that the city needs to develop policies and zoning that allow hen keeping. I bring these two recommendations up because neither of them will be in the final plan. So in the late stage of the planning process, our draft plans and proposed recommendations went through dozens of layers of checks and balances and city agency approvals. Um, so for instance, if the water department didn't like that we were advocating for better water infrastructure and more support for growers, then that recommendation came out the plan. If the health department didn't like that we were advocating for hen keeping because they're obsessed with avian flu, then that recommendation came out the plan. And this part of the process uh, for me was probably the hardest and definitely the most discouraging. But while the plan um, is a great one, you'll see the draft plan, um, the final plan set to come out in the next couple of months. It is a great plan and we poured a lot of love, a lot of care and a lot of work into it. It's not the plan that some of us set out to make. And that brings me to lesson number three. Don't settle, but know that you will have to settle when working with city agencies and government. I'm gonna say that again. Don't settle, but know that you will have to settle when working with city agencies and government. And I say don't settle because if you enter in with the mindset that you have to settle, then you might compromise more easily and be likely to give up on some things. And that's not what we did. We fought tooth and nail for some of the things we really wanted to see in this plan from the thing for the things that community said needed to go in this plan. Sorry, I said my internet was unstable. Can somebody say in the chat they can hear me okay, just to, so I can know I can keep going. Can y'all hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, yes. awesome. Thank you, I appreciate y'all. Um, I also want us to realize that city government and city agencies won't work against their own interests. Honestly, that goes for any institution, any like major institution, it goes for universities, it goes for all of them. These institutions exist to maintain order and control. They exist to make a profit. So some of the things that we were asking for in this plan would transition control of land and agriculture from the city into the community. So the reality of the situation is that some of what we're asking for it's not going to be given, it's not going to be readily given to us by the city or our governments, but it must be demanded and taken by residents and community. And that I think by the end of the process is a little bit, it was, it was a moment of that we had to accept. Um, and I think we maybe were a little bright eyed and bushy tail when we first started. We were like, we're going to do all of this radical stuff. Um, and the city was like, Mm, we'll see. So uh, we really envision this plan as a tool to navigate some of the city's convoluted policies around land access and land purchases. We also hope that um, growers will find resources in this plan that help them to continue to continue to grow their work. We designed this plan for city agencies who are uh, strategically poised to invest in and help evolve our local food system. And we believe that these agencies are key to moving Philadelphia, not key, but at least in terms of moving the plan forward, these agencies are key to moving um, the system, moving toward a system that is more just and understands and honors the value of agriculture to residents. 
We also designed this plan for the many individuals and groups who support city government and will help city government implement the plan. So this includes um, larger nonprofits like uh, larger nonprofits or um, uh, city council or not city councils, uh, food councils. So like food policy advisory council, uh, it includes the Public Interest Law Center, Philadelphia Neighborhood Gardens Trust and PHS. Um, and it was also designed, we, this plan with philanthropic partners in mind who will help the city move towards implementation. And at the end of the day, if you eat food, then we design the plan for. The plan is for everybody. The plan is for everybody and anybody, whether if you want to grow food and you want to figure out how to do that, how to expand that. If you want to, if you eat food, if you want to figure out ways to consume um, local food or, or food that is uh, uh, environmentally sustainable, you know, this plan, this plan is truly for everybody. So our overarching goal goals for the plan um, are organized based on chapter and theme. So we have six chapters in this plan and they are land, production, preparation and distribution, consumption, food waste reduction and recovery, and people. Um, one, one design aspect that I really love about this plan um, is that we recognize that land is at the center of everything that we do, especially in the food system, land touches everything, but really like our whole lives, land is at the center, right? And that people, you know, in many ways are one of the forces, not the only force by any means, but one of the forces that help to move the work forward, where that help, we should be helping to steward the land and care for land all over this world. So with that in mind, we designed people in land to be um, like the spine of the, the plan. So the if you uh, can see the colors, um, land is this dark or this like medium brown color and people is this like tan or beige color. Um, and that is right going down the middle of the book. And that is consistent throughout the entire um, and we designed a new food system graphic that's actually a spiral um, that uh, was inspired by ferns and the uncoiling and the coiling that ferns do. So, you know, all of these things are interconnected and we really had a hard time siloing them or separating them into different chapters. So as you read the plan, if you read the plan, you'll notice there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of redundancy. That's because there is no, you know, you can't talk about land without talking about people, without talking about production or, you know, all of the different things. So, um, yeah, for this, uh, for the land chapter, we really wanted to increase land security for growers. Uh, we advocated for increasing access to growing space in all neighborhoods. Um, and we advocated for increasing stewardship of the land. In terms of production, our hope is uh, that this plan will help build long-term support for urban agriculture initiatives um, and build those initiatives into the city's infrastructure policies and programs. For preparation and distribution, we hope that this plan will help um, the city and different partners to invest in existing and new local systems necessary to support a sustainable, just, and equitable food system in our city. Um, as for consumption, we hope that this plan will help build long-term support for locally sourced, nutritious meals and increase fresh food access in the city's infrastructure. As for food waste reduction and recovery, we hope that this plan will help the city to be accountable to existing zero waste commitments. There are already policies that exist um, in the city about waste reduction that are not, that are being ignored, frankly. Um, as for people, we hope that this plan will help the city to help city council, to help agencies and partners to recognize the role urban agriculture can play in the lives and livelihoods of people and communities. So now that brings me to our final multiple choice question. And that is which of all the lessons I covered today, I mean, not all, there was only three, but of the three lessons I covered today relating to uh, urban planning, 
um, collaborative urban planning, which lesson is the most important? Is it A, lesson number one, in collaborative planning or any collaborative work really, it's important to begin with relationship building and establishing a foundation of how we want to be to one another? Is it lesson number two, B, if you're a planner or pushing for a plan to be done in your neighborhood, advocate for a partnership where planners and community members or grassroots groups have equal decision-making power? Or is it less three, don't settle, but also know that you will have to settle when working with city agencies and governments? Or is it D, they're all very important and may be more relevant at different stages of the planning process. Okay, looks like uh, most people said they're all equally important in the planning process and some, 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 uh, some answers, some votes for the other answers. Honestly, this is kind of a trick question because which, you know, it, whether or not something is important, most important um, is all subjective. So it, it depends on who you are, what you value. Um, I think they're all important. I think they're important at different stages of the planning process. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's just, that one was like a trick question. Um, oh, but I, you know, for me, I said D, they're all important. And some of them were, some of them were important, very important early on. Some of them were very important in the middle. Some of them were important throughout. I think the relationship building is, you know, important throughout the process. It helps maintain open, honest, transparent communication. For us, you know, after that whole reconciliation and facilitation process, we were able to have much more direct and open dialogue, whereas before stuff was kind of passive aggressive and it didn't sit right with me or my, um, my friends who were also on the plan. So, you know, all of this, you know, depends on who you are, depends on um, where you are in the planning process as well. So thank you all for your time today. Uh, that's all I have for you. Um, I'd like to open it up for any questions and perhaps a discussion. So if you're interested in more details about the process, I'm happy to share. Uh, just, just let me know, write it in the chat, email me, um, whatever works. Uh, lastly, I did say that you could see the draft plan and you can at that bottom link, phillyagplan.com. You can view the, the full draft plan. Um, the draft plan, the draft plan is pretty much the final plan now with some minor tweaks because the comment period is closed. We had, I think, a three week or a month long comment period. Um, but yeah, check it out. You can also get the historic timeline by going to that link. Um, and any of the other material that we use throughout the planning process. There were several news articles written about it. You can find those there as well. Um, if you wanna connect with me, my email address, my Twitter and my Instagram um, are on screen. My Twitter is Grip. that's D-O-C-T-A-G-R-I-P. Um, my email address is A, B as in boy, G as in girl, 66 at drexel.edu. And my Instagram is uh, Dr. Farmer, and that's D-O-C-T-A, Farmer. Uh, thank you all for your time again, and I look forward to answering some questions. Thank you, Ash. That was phenomenal. Uh, you know, as a Philly native, I'm like, woo, 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 yeah, yeah, <laughs> repping hard. Um, <clears throat> please put the Q&A or please put your questions in the Q&A box. And um, we're gonna get started. We only have a few minutes for a discussion. So the first question is, do you want to engage in agricultural commons, cooperative land ownership, institutional or private land ownership? How are you thinking about longevity when thinking about your land movement? So that's multiple questions in there, but um, yeah, take a stab at any or all. And don't forget you could tag team with me now. Um, so I'm guessing this question is like about me personally, like my, like not the political work because, or like the policy work, because I don't have no control over what the city does in terms of that. But um, for me personally, um, 
Well, one thing I didn't talk at all about is land-based drawings. Um, and land-based drawings, uh, like Shakira mentioned, is a, a grassroots group um, led by four Black women um, in Philadelphia, helping to reconnect folks to the land, um, reconnect. Specifically, we work with um, uh, Black women, um, Black trans folks, and Black non-binary folks. Um, around land-based spiritual practices, around farming and agriculture. We are deeply um, and consistent, constantly inspired by Octavia Butler. A lot of our work um, does draw on some of the skills highlighted in Parable of Sower. So we do some um, carpentry work uh, with our, our folks. We do uh, safety and self-defense work. I bring up land-based joints because that's where a lot of our conversations around um, collective work, uh, community control of land, collective land ownership, that's where a lot of those conversations in my life are happening. Um, so a lot of the people who are a part of land-based joints or have come through land-based joints um, in many ways are like family to me. Uh, and what we keep hearing is like, you know, we, we've engaged um, um, intergenerationally. So we've heard from, you know, older folks, folks um, who have disabilities, like, yo, what is it gonna look like for us to, to care for each other? Like, are we, like, how do we have conversations about um, collective living, uh, cooperative living, cooperative ownership? Um, so to answer, I think maybe one of those questions in there, uh, yes, that is something that I, feel called to. Um, and, you know, that is something I'm exploring with other people. And we're having conversations about what that could look like, because it ain't easy. I think it's kind of, you know, people make it seem like everything cooperative, everything collective is just easy and roses and butterflies. And it's really hard, you know, like it's, you, it, it there's a lot, they, a lot of work, self-work that people have to do to show up in those spaces and be good to each other. So I think where we're really starting is with that self-work. Like, how do we work on ourselves? Um, how do we care for each other in this capacity so that we can keep building, you know, up towards this, this goal of living together and being together on the land? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for unfolding that. And I love land-based drawings. I think this is a whole movement <clears throat> where Black folks in particular are, are remembering that <clears throat> we, we really need the land if we're going to thrive, not just survive, but thrive in this system. And so when, when things go down, when, uh, let's see, droughts and floods and racist mm -hmm. terrorist attacks and all these things mm -hmm. unfold, uh, we need to know how, how to commune with the land, right, in ways that will ensure our survival. And yeah. um, and I love land-based dawns as a, as a way for like people to get involved in that work, to like skill up in a, in a really spiritually based community grassroots setting. And that's just really so beautiful. And I feel like, you know, you, you just hit on like, what is for me, like the biggest, the biggest part of it, or like maybe the biggest push is that like in Philly, we don't always have access to stuff like that. Like I grew up in Philly. I grew up not around a whole lot of trees, not, a, you know, my family wasn't big into farming or agriculture or like, you know, I don't know. I, I grew up as like just a regular John from Philly. So, you know, like, the whole goal is that we're we're helping folks who might not ever have had exposure to these things, black folks who've never had exposure to these things, you know, but who have that exposure to those things ancestrally in your our ancestral memory to reconnect to that. And that's, you know, to me, part of one of the most beautiful parts of the work that we're doing. It's not it's not necessarily, you know, we welcome all of the people at all stages in their land and farming journey, but it's not necessarily for the ones who have arrived. It's for everybody, you know. For sure. So just on a, a point of clarification, I I realized that not everyone may know what a John is. And so could you unpack that <laughs> for us, you know? No, the, you you unpack it for us. <laughs> Um, I'll start and then you can jump in if necessary. Um, so 
John is a is a Philly based colloquialism um, that really means a person, place, or thing. So within the urban ad context, right? Like a carrot is a John. Boots are John, <laughs> right? Like um, a for a person working on the farm is a John. So it's um, it's it's a way to identify something or someone within this like cultural context of Philly, particularly Black Philly, um, that's very unapologetic and very like, um, we are here, we are seeing, you know, we see each other and this is how we choose to relate to each other. So it's like a term of affirmation, a term of endearment in certain ways. Um, and I just, I love that you named your organi organization that because it's so affirmative to who we are as a people. That's right. Okay, so looking for some more questions. I would love to pose a few questions, but I want to give everyone the chance to to really, you know, delve into Ashley's brilliance while we have her for a few more minutes. So I'm just going to wait for. Okay, here here's one. When reaching out to the community. For example, for involvement with sessions, focus groups, comments, feedback, what communication methods and strategies do you find most useful for making sure to reach everyone and getting the best turnout? Um, I think it depends on like who you're talking about when you say the community, you know, different, it, it, it depends. So for us, like in terms of like urban egg folks, a lot of it, you know, social media is just now a, a, a way that people see things and also word of mouth, like the urban ag community in Philadelphia is uh, like tapped into each other. Like people know what's going on. This person talked to this person, this person talked to this person. So a lot of what we did was word of mouth, you know, just like I said, um, I think I said earlier, so much of a, so much um, of our success was because we hold these relationships. So, you know, everyone in soil generation holds a bunch of relationships with other growers in the city. Um, we're connected to people in different ways. And I found that that was probably, uh, I think that that was part of why it was so, um, we had such a great turnout in terms of engagement. And each relationship we have, then those people have relationships with other people. So it really was about leveraging our networks. Um, it's happening into the network. Um, we, like I said, we did a lot of social media pushes. Um, there was also some media coverage of what we were doing. So, you know, um, WHYY has like a, a, like a news outlet called Plan Philly. So they covered a lot of our work and, and got it out there. Um, and I would say, honestly, now, like thinking back, those were two, probably two of the, the main ways because not everybody's going to be on social media. That's definitely like the younger generations. Um, but then having those relationships is how we connected with the other folks, like older folks. And, um, you know, like my grandma and my aunt was at the public meeting. <laughs> and they're like part of the, you know, when I talk about like Philly people from Philly who are not really plugged into ag work or food work or, you know, the environmental sustainable stuff, they are like interested, you know, they're, they're kind of the, some of the people um, who came through. And that's why I said that our, our, we designed this plan for everybody, not just growers, not just people who, who already plugged in, but we could design it for everybody. Um, so I, I hope I answered your question. Social media and word of mouth and relationships um, were the, the biggest ways that we uh, connected with folks. Thanks for that. That was, that was a beautiful answer. All right, moving on to the next one. You mentioned how the way you get involved or you are involved doing community participatory research was less common in academia. How do you see differences between what you decided to do with your education versus other people or your fellow classmates? And how did you get the skills you needed to do the work you do with communities? That's a good question. Um, I'm teaching, I'm actually, um, I start teaching in April, I'm teaching community-based participatory research methods. 
Um, and I, I've been working to, to redesign the course. Um, I, I don't want to say I don't believe in CBPR or participatory action research, but I think I think those methods have gone through such like um, such a lot of filtering through the academy, um, and they don't necessarily serve the need of my people. Um, I think a lot of times these methods are encouraged because they check a box on a grant, you know, a grant that's like, you have to do community engagement. You have to, so people will go to a CBPR and without having a deep understanding of what CBPR actually is or was intended to do. Um, I, uh, in my process, okay, here's the, here's the, I think here's the main difference. I didn't engage with a community in order to do the research that I needed to do. I was already rooted in a community from way before I even decided to go back to school and do academia, where CBP, CBPR and these other action researchers, research methods, a lot of times are like, here are ways to engage community for your work. That's inherent, to me, that's inherently extractive. It's like, how can I, connect with you to get what I need to do. And then also I'll do something for you in the process. Now, you know, I think that's what academia is built on is extraction. So it's, there's like a, there, you're kind of at odds. Um, and I feel that way very much so being in the academy, just being hundred percent honest. Um, like the way I want to be in the world, the way I want to show up, the way um, I want to live my life is contradictory to what they want you to do and be in the academy. Um, so I guess the way that I'm doing it is I'm just not I'm doing what I want to do. Um, I went and got my own funding during my doctoral education from the Robert Johnson Foundation. And they were like, we support you to study what you want to study. Um, and, you know, I, I received a lot of, uh, uh, not backlash, but there were a lot of people who tried to steer me otherwise at Harvard, um, to steer me to do things that were, that there was data for, that they were easily measurable, or, you know, things that made sense in their minds, because, oh, back when I was doing this, y'all was 2017, people didn't understand what urban agriculture was, they were like, that's not a thing, um, why would you study that, and now all of a sudden, everybody want to do it, so, you know, I think for me, um, the difference is like being true to my values, understanding what those values are and being accountable to my community and my people. So when I when I did start coming up with research questions as a doctoral student, I was I brought it to my, my friends, my homies. I was like, y'all, this is what I'm thinking about asking. Does this even make sense? And they were like, no, this will not serve our movement. This will not serve our interests. Maybe you should think about these things and inform what I did. So I think part of it is that you got to be ready and willing to drop what you think you know and what you think you want to study for what folks actually tell you will be useful um, for their work and for their movements. Um, that's not common, at least at the school I'm at, the, the university I'm at. So I don't know if that is common at other universities, um, but sometimes it can feel very lonely and isolating coming from that perspective. Um, and being deeply rooted in the same community where the institution is and the institution has done harm. All snaps. <laughs> I love that. I couldn't have said it better myself. All right, moving on. We'll take two more. Um, how can groups focused on collectivism and relationship building put pressure on institutions that only care about capitalism and profit? In another way to... <laughs> <laughs> How do we retain the focus on community when we often have to work within capitalist systems? The question of the world. <laughs> right. I'm like, I'm not supposed to answer that. I don't know. I'm trying to figure this out too. Um, pressure on institutions organized, you know, like that's the thing that comes to mind is like 
And like when I think about organizing, you know, the first I think one of the first people to tell me, like, you are an organizer was Katrina. And I know you know Katrina and she's lovely. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, like so much of that is about holding relationships, you know, sh- showing up genuinely and authentically, loving people. I heard um that one of a, or a previous speaker in a movie was something about like people giving you clues to how to love them. Like that's that's you know how I how I move. I just try to lead with love and care. Um, and I think that is, let me go back to the question, make sure I'm hitting on it. Um, I think that when we lead with love and care for our people, for Mama Earth, for all of this, um, then we have those, the, like those relationships are easily established. And then we have the ability and the power to organize ourselves to push these institutions who only care about capitalism or business or profit or whatever, what have you. Um, but honestly, I mean, that's that's like the, the kumbaya cute answer, but like this stuff is really hard. Like, you know, I'm constantly discouraged at where I'm at because of the way I see the institution and the university moving and the way I see them extracting from the community that I come from. Um, and I don't, I'm true, truthfully don't know the answer to this question, um, but I think we keep, we keep working towards it. We keep trying different things. We keep organizing and, you know, caring for ourselves and each other. Right, right. Yeah, I don't think anyone has like a really straightforward answer to that. All right, so last one. Did you speak about if or how cultural arts, especially any community cultural arts play a role in Philly's urban ag space? What what, uh, what we mean by like, community cultural arts so my my intuition or my assumption is um like maybe um capoeira maybe it's the afro-brazilian martial art west african drum and dance hip-hop spoken word other things even like culinary arts you know like the gamut i mean (laughs) like directly unclear to me, like what the, I think what comes to mind is like, when you talk about capoeira, I'm like, oh, I know a black farmer from Philly who like is really into capoeira and is, you know, sharing that with his community. And, um, you know, me and uh, and our, uh, uh, the Land Bay Shores Leadership Circle, we doing drum, drumming, taking drumming lessons together, like West African drumming lessons together. So, you know, I think that what's coming up for me in my spirit right now is that um, as we, the different movement work that we do is all connected. Um, you know, uh, returning to some of our cultural, our ancestral practices is also what fuels me and also is a place of rest for me so that I can keep doing this other work that I'm doing. Um, You know, like, or the fact that like so many West African dances or, um, you know, different like drum tunes are for farming are for are related to food are for, related to like spirituality and spiritual practices um you know i i see more people specifically black people um because that's that's my experience uh reclaiming and reconnecting to all of these things at the same time in a beautiful way and i think you know even if there's not an explicit like here's how the old arts is informing agriculture it's all kind of like mixed up and wrapped up in us like we're being called to similar things um yeah that's all I that's all I can think of on that one yeah yeah that's great thank you so much um there is a final question of when you're going to run for elected office and that's probably more rhetorical (laughs) yeah because listen you know to keep it a a, be a hundred keep it keep it real I not first 
I think I first, when I was first applying to doctoral programs, I wrote in my little personal statement, I'm going to run for mayor of Philadelphia. And then I went through this plan and I said, oh, I will never want to do political nothing ever. So that's not for me. Yeah. Thank you. I think that was a compliment. <laughs> All right. We're going to move to our word cloud. Um, the, the link will be in the chat in a moment. Please think of one word that you're taking away from this talk and, oh yeah, scan the QR code or visit the link in the chat that will be in there and share one word. And this is Moyo blessing us in our, in our closing. Shakira, I didn't get it, but do you know which word Moyo was saying he most took away from this talk? <laughs> oh, he's saying lemon. So he has a lime in his hand and it's it's a lemon to him. So that's what he was saying. There we go. <laughs> All right, John. Yes, love it. Philly community, inspiring collective land security inclusion. Grassroots, urban farming, roots, agriculture, prejudice, literacy, farmer, investment, uh, prejudice, love food, urbanization, regeneration, garden, compromise, don't settle. Yes, 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 yes. Defiance. I love it. Well, thank y'all for for joining and listening. Uh, big gratitude to Ashley for sharing uh, your stories with us and just all of your brilliance with your experience. And we're, yeah, so thankful. And um, Leah, looking forward to the next one, everyone. Have a good evening.